why don't we get started? Uh, so where we, oh yes, so if you haven't finished the reading by now, you should have finished it by now. Um, and there is a homework, homework number two, uh, was put up on the blast blackboard, I guess last night technically, um, but it's out, it will be due in one week. And on that assignment, you'll be proving whether or not the sample uh, variance S squared is biased or unbiased. Uh, is it consistent or inconsistent? And you'll be doing that proof both mathematically um, using uh, the consistency and biasness proof, as well as empirically, uh, which is what we did uh, with the sample mean X bar uh, in MATLAB in class. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So please make sure you look at it right away. Well, not necessarily now, but you know today would be good. Yes. Yes, yes. And so you're going to demonstrate what was solved mathematically in MATLAB. Uh, and that's what I mean by empirically. Yes. Any other questions? No? All right. So where we left off, uh, we talked about a bunch of things. And we'll continue on uh, with our discussion uh, about visualization. And we talked about the relationship uh, between the median, big M, and the mean, mu. And this relationship can tell us a little bit uh, about the gross level behavior of a particular distribution. And so one of them said if uh, uh, the sample mean, the sample median big M is the same as the, uh, as the mean mu, uh, that means the distribution is so-called symmetric. And if you look at the distribution, uh, the classic bell curve, the normal distribution, you can see that if you go some amount uh, plus or minus uh, to the left and to the right of the sample mean mu, uh, the probability, the projection along the vertical axis uh, is the same, right? Um, so that means it's symmetric. And that talks about this idea uh, that we've mentioned of preference for certain types of values, whether the system or the distribution more correctly governing the values uh, that you're measuring, uh, the samples you're taking, does it prefer uh, all values equally uh, or does it prefer larger values, or does it prefer uh, smaller values? And this is used, or this information, or this type of information uh, is used, it's very important uh, to a lot of different communities. Uh, so then we also talked about uh, these cases where the distribution is so-called skewed. We had skewed to the right, so meaning the tail of the distribution goes off to the right, so it prefers um, larger values, uh, or skewed to the left, or left skewed as it's called sometimes, uh, if you uh, read through the literature, uh, where the tail of the distribution uh, goes off uh, to the left. And so if you are skewed left, how you test for that is you compare the sample uh, median, or rather the median, M, big M, uh, to the mean mu. And if M is larger than mu, you say skewed left. Uh, if M is smaller than mu, uh, we say skewed right. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Then we also um, generalize this idea of the median. And the median, when we thought about it, it chops your distribution, it's that value or that observation, such that it chops the distribution into two equal parts. Uh, equal meaning if you were to take the integral or the area under the curve for the distribution uh, up from minus infinity to the mean, to the median rather, uh, and from the median up to positive infinity, you get equal parts probability or 0.5. Right? And so the idea then uh, for generalizing the median, we talked about this idea of selecting uh, measurements or values that chop the distribution into some number of equally sized parts. And so the quartiles uh, chop the distribution into 25% or 0.25 equally sized parts, uh, but this is generalized beyond just two parts or four parts, uh, and we talked about this idea of the percentile. And so um, the percentile had a definition, and we discussed that, and we talked about um, how you might calculate that uh, using an integral, um, if you're talking about uh, the uh, percentile, or you can uh, use that via, uh, compute that, rather, uh, via calculation or by counting, rather. And so this is an example of the quartiles. Here we have uh, a normal distribution, and we've chopped this thing up into uh, 0.25 uh, equally sized uh, parts, 
And so we have the first quartile, uh, which represents up to and including 25% uh, of the values under consideration uh, governed by this distribution. We have the second quartile is also uh, the median. And we have the third quartile, which is the 75% point. And then if you were to talk about the fourth quartile, which no one really says, um, that would be that 100% point. But you can't really calculate that because of the tails. Um, so nonetheless, uh, we talked about other ways of talking about uh, these percentiles. We said there's a quantile. Uh, that traffics in proportions. We have a percentile that traffics in percentages. And then we also have quartiles, uh, which you can map back and forth between percentages and relate them uh, to the median. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So then we also showed how we can look at dispersion and also we can uh, detect this idea of outliers or oddballs uh, using relationships uh, between the quartiles. And so we have uh, Q1, the first quartile, Q2, the second quartile, and Q3, the third quartile. And we have this example, we have a bunch of measurements and you can take the difference between the first quartile and the third quartile. Uh, and in this particular case, because it's the sample quartile we're talking about, uh, we use this hatted uh, not notation. And so here we have Q1 hat, and Q1 hat exceeds at most 25% uh, percent of the measurements here. In this example, we have a bunch of measurements, uh, 1 through 12, and so 4 would be the uh, first quartile. Likewise, 10 would be uh, the third quartile, sample quartile Q3 hat, which exceeds at most 75% of your measurements. And so in this case, it would be 10. Uh, and we subtract uh, Q1 from Q3, and we get some number. We multiply that times um, 1.5, and that gives us, uh, as we discussed, 1.5 IQR hat, or interquartile range. So we can use this IQR this interquartile range, the difference between Q3 and Q1, uh, to tell us something about the dispersion or how scattered or how widely scattered the different values are under consideration. And so we calculated um, for this example, uh, IQR, uh, which is 10 minus 4 or 6 multiplied by 1.5. Uh, and so that's 6 times 1.5, which is 9. Um, and then we took our interquartile range and we subtracted that from Q1, the first quartile, and we added that uh, also to Q3, and that defines the bounds of the range of values that represent 99.3% of the population of values. And so very quickly, if you have a set of samples, uh, you can sort them in non-decreasing order, uh, and you can uh, pick out Q1 and Q3, you can compute a 1.5 IQR, and then you subtract and add, and that gives you a great way to detect if subsequent measurements are outliers. Okay, and so for this case, 99.3% of the population falls in the range between minus 5 and 19, uh, where minus 5 is the left-hand bound, which is uh, Q1, our first quartile, minus 1.5 IQR, uh, where also this uh, 19 is um, the right-hand bound, which is Q3 plus 1.5 IQR, okay? So a quick and dirty way, let's say, you know, you're on a very limited uh, platform, let's say you're making heart measurements or some sort of biometric measurement, and you want to know if some subsequent measurement is an outlier relative to maybe the first few minutes worth of measurements, uh, you could do something like this quite easily. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? All right. So that's where we left off. Uh, let's continue on uh, with our uh, module on visualization. This uh, follows up on that. And let's look to the histogram. Now, certainly in statistics, lots of beautiful theories uh, abound, but there is no substitute uh, for looking at your data, examining your data. Uh, that's going to do two things, as you found in the assignment uh, that you uh, submitted based on the map uh, visualization. Um, it can give you a sense of what distribution you should use uh, or could use if you were to model it, but it also helps you hone in on what you think is important uh, as far as that population under study is concerned. <clears throat> and so in order to properly visualize uh, the pattern phenomena or the pattern of interest in your data, it's very key that you form an appropriate uh, visualization. And so some examples of this. 
you might be interested in the probability distribution and looking at its shape. Uh, maybe you want to know what types of values are more likely uh, to occur, or perhaps the converse, what types of values are least likely to occur. Um, you might want to know what statistical method or what measurement over the data is most appropriate. The visualization will help inform you about what is most appropriate. You might want to determine if outliers are present in your data, because for certain types of processes and procedures, uh, you do something differently if you have outliers versus if you don't have outliers uh, in your data. Um, perhaps there are temporal phenomena, things that change in time. Uh, so streaming data, and you might be interested in general trends or patterns, if you will, where the data is going. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying the same? Uh, and so temporal ideas about how values change might be of importance to you. And therefore, when you visualize, that will help you uncover what is most appropriate. Or perhaps you might be interested, say, in relationships between variables. Uh, when one variable goes up, another one goes down by a certain amount or behaves in a certain way, right? That's really, really important, especially for things like supply chain, where the cost or some sort of uh, change in one item uh, dramatically affects the outcome of the finished goods. And we saw that uh, idea of relationships when we talked about going from cacao to finished chocolate. Okay. Um, any questions about this? So... Hopefully, uh, at this juncture, I've convinced you sufficiently uh, that visualization is very, very important. And as you saw with the IRS data, sometimes data is not very straightforward. And as you can imagine, in some cases, you might have to synthesize your data set by looking at a bunch of different sources of information and then putting together that table. Right. Um, just at first approximation for this class, uh, it was important just to give you an existing data set. But it's not always that straightforward uh, in reality. Okay, so a histogram, right? You all have probably all seen histograms, and it's a simple function in MATLAB, uh, but it's a very important visualization tool. A histogram allows you to, dis, uh, to visualize the shape of the probability mass function or density function uh, that governs your data, right? Uh, whether you knew it or not. Uh, you can also use it to identify outliers or homogeneity, meaning are the values you measure pretty much the same, do they vary very little, uh, or are there widely, broadly varying values uh, from your system of measurement? And so procedurally, you can actually write code uh, to produce a histogram, but we're not going to do that in this class. We have uh, to our, uh, uh, we can avail ourselves of uh, APIs in MATLAB and things like Python have it in Python statistics package and other languages too. Java has it as well. And so the procedure is you divide, define uh, so-called intervals uh, or bins of equal size, right? So if you're dealing, say, with temperatures, you might have your bins of size 10 representing a span of 10 degrees for 0 to 10 degrees, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and so forth. But the size of your bins uh, is going to change how you represent your distribution. And even in choosing a histogram, one particularly important consideration uh, in any histogram, whether you're writing it yourself or using an, an existing API, is determining what the right uh, number of bins are. Because if you have more bins, uh, that range of values represented by each bin will certainly be smaller. If you have fewer bins, that range of values uh, is going to be larger. And so you have this trade-off, all else being equal. So if you have a fixed amount of data or measurements, um, you're effectively distributing this data among the different bins. And so if you have more bins, of course, you're going to need to make sure that you have enough data um, that you're measuring or that you have available uh, to have a good or, or, or realistic representation of values within those bins. Because if you have a lot of bins, some bins uh, could be empty, right? On the converse, uh, if you have a very small number of bins, well, it's more likely that each bin will have a measurement that falls within the range of its boundaries, uh, but it might not be granular enough. So if you're trying to determine, you know, should I bring my, my heavy jacket or should I bring my sweatshirt today? And if I said your temperature can either be low or high, right? Well, that's not very interesting, right? Uh, maybe low is uh, from 50 to 100 degrees, um, is from zero to 50 degrees, and high is from 51 to 100 degrees, right? So I could say the temperature is low, and you'd be like, well, how low is it, right? It's not fine-grained enough or granular enough um, to make a difference because, you know, you're going to do something different if it's zero degrees or 10 degrees versus if it's 45 degrees or 50 degrees, 
Okay. And so you need to make sure when you set your histogram to also uh, for the bins uh, size of so the number of bins, you want to consider your data as well as how much data you have, how much the data varies, uh, because the bin size is going to impact your ability uh, to faithfully visualize the probability mass function uh, if it's a discrete distribution governing your system under study or the density function uh, if it is a continuous distribution. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Okay. So you set your bin size uh, and indirectly the number of bins. Uh, you iterate through your data and then you count how many data points fall in each interval uh, defined uh, by the bin boundaries. Now, in fact, in MATLAB, you know, typically when you call a histogram, you call a hist and you give it uh, some data. You can actually uh, catch its return value, assign it to a variable, and then from that, uh, you get access to the histogram object in MATLAB and then can ask it for things like uh, the counts in the bins, uh, the boundaries of the bins, uh, and so forth. So let's take a look at a histogram, and this is uh, in the book. On the left-hand side, we have what's called the frequency histogram in frame A, and on the right-hand side, uh, we have what's called a relative frequency histogram, and the two are very much related. And so let's uh, look at the frequency histogram uh, on the left, and this is the histogram uh, you're probably very familiar with. It depicts the counts of data points occurring in each bin. So along the horizontal axis, uh, we have the bin boundaries, right? So this one looks like it's about from 0 to 14, 14 to 28, 28 to um, uh, 46, and so forth. Uh, and when you represent the items in a bin, typically you describe a bin uh, uh, by its center value, right? But each bin boundary, uh, the upper and the lower um, value associated with items in the bins, uh, those are also given to you, and you can ask MATLAB for those values uh, if you assign the return from histogram function call uh, to some variable. So on the horizontal axis, uh, we have um, the bin boundaries, and on the vertical axis, uh, we have the counts. And so, for example, uh, the first bin here with boundaries between 0 and it looks like 14, we only have a count of 1, whereas for the next bin, uh, it looks like we have a count of 5. Right? And that visualizes your distribution as a system of counts. Now, certainly, you can take this distribution, this frequency histogram, and you can divide each bin count by the total number of measurements you have. How do you get the bin count? Well, you know the array size that you gave it when you called histogram, but you can also add up the individual bin counts, and that'll give you the total number of measurements over which you computed the histogram. So you take this total uh, number of samples or measurements, uh, and you divide each bin count by that, and it gives you this relative frequency histogram. This is exactly a distribution. Right? So if you think about what a distribution is, it says what is the likelihood or the proportion or the number of times in an infinite number of trials for which you're going to see a certain value. Now in the case of the relative frequency histogram, if you look at, say, for example, uh, the first bin here, uh, for values between 0 and 14, uh, you're going to have a probability or the relative, relative proportion of it looks like um, 0 0.03, uh, 0 0.03 um, three, five, uh, for example, right? And so this relative frequency histogram is exactly a probability distribution. Is it precise? Well, precise is an interesting question. It's a depiction of it because to make this uh, relative frequency histogram very, very representative of the actual distribution, you're going to have to make sure you have quote unquote enough samples. Right? If you have some distribution, and let's say that distribution um, favors um, a lot of large values, for example, uh, it's, right, uh, it's uh, right skewed, and let's say you only take two samples, and just from luck of the draw, your two samples happen to be small values, and then you computed the histogram. That's not going to adequately represent uh, that particular uh, governing distribution of your population. And so you really need to make sure if you're going to use uh, a relative frequency histogram or any histogram, uh, you want to make sure that you have enough samples that are representative of the types of values, large, small, medium, what have you, that you're going to encounter in practice. Okay? And so literally, if you wanted to sample from a distribution, right, you could sample a whole bunch of values, uh, you could calculate a relative frequency histogram, and then you could use the proportions for each bin as the stick weights in a stick-breaking construct. construct.
Okay, literally, and that's called bootstrapping a distribution when you're using the data um, to stand in place for the underlying distribution, and you could perform sampling from that with stick breaking. Okay, all right. Any questions about this? Does this make sense? Okay, so that's the histogram. And so let's take a brief look, I'll pop out to MATLAB, and we'll take a brief look at a bunch of distributions. I'll defer the mixture uh, to the next few slides, but I'll just talk about it at this juncture, and we'll uh, take a look at the mixture. Uh, so we have the uniform distribution, uh, which is a um, continuous distribution. We have the exponential, which traffics in time between events, so that's a continuous distribution, has a mass function, uniform has a mass function, and then we have the normal distribution, uh, which has that uh, classic bell curve shape, uh, which is also um, a continuous distribution, and we said from last semester that so-called inertial quantities are well uh, defined or well described by a normal distribution. And by inertial, I mean things whose future values are dependent on the current value, like temperature, position, uh, velocity, and so forth. And then we have a mixture, and for this mixture, it's a set of distributions. In this particular case, it's a mixture of two normal distributions. A normal distribution is governed uh, by its mean, the center, and its variance, the square root of which is a standard deviation that describes how dispersed, how far to the left and right, uh, these values that you observe will vary. So we have some probability mass on the so-called tails of this distribution going out to the left and the right, and as you can see, uh, the normal distribution is symmetric. Uh, with the mixture, there are two normal distributions, and if you kind of imagine a normal envelope or shape, we have one here, its center is mu1, another one here is mu2, and you can see that these two distributions overlap with one another. Right? They put probability uh, density over shared values. And so typically, when you define something like the homeless population that we've been carrying as an example of sampling, you would model these things using a mixture. And this mixture could either be overlapping, the individual there's component distributions in that mixture, or they can be non-overlapping. And in our example, we assumed that they were non-overlapping. So let's pop out of here, out of the slides, and bring up MATLAB, and we'll try uh, a few examples of the impact of sample size and uh, the number of bins as it pertains to samples from uh, these distributions. Okay, so I'm gonna exit and show here. And let me bring up MATLAB. And I will call it <clears throat> sampling test, uh, new script. Uh, let me save that. Sampling test 2020, and I'll certainly post this uh, on the uh, Blackboard alongside uh, the slides uh, for module lecture number five. All right, so here we have num samples, and let's just set that initially to 10 samples, and let's just sample from the uniform distribution, and we're going to choose um, a, excuse me, for the uniform distribution, uh, let's say to be one, and B, uh, the other parameter for the uniform distribution, let's call it 100. Uh, and uh, we're going to say um, uniform samples um, uh, equals uniform, unif R and D. And we're going to give it A and B. And we're going to say give us a 1 by num samples sized array. Okay, so here we're going to sample uniformly. Um, on the closed interval on the real number line uh, between 1 and 100. So we could have numbers like 1, 2, 7, 99, or 90.732. Uh, it can be any uh, number on the real number line. So now let's uh, type histogram. Um, let's say num, num uniform bins. And let's just start with 10 bins. Now, if you call the histogram uh, function API call in MATLAB, it defaults to 10 bins unless you uh, specify otherwise. So we say hist um, uniform samples and give it num uniform bins. We'll do this and display, I think I probably histogram spelled out, histogram, histogram. All right, display done. That display done is just something I like to do just because uh, I like to have an executable statement on which I can set a breakpoint 
uh, without being part of the code per se. All right, so let's do that. And we run sampling test, we display, and we'll notice here, okay, we have 10 bins, all right? So um, these 10 bins are of equal size. This is kind of weird, all right? And some of the, there are a lot of gaps in here, right? So we have a gap starting out zero, a gap here, the third one, this one is full, the fourth one, um, a couple gaps. And you'll notice here, this doesn't really look uniform, right? Uniform, uh, going back to uh, the original slides, it should be straight across, right? Although in the example in the book, it's not straight across, uh, meaning equal probability uh, among all the values. And so this isn't very much uh, very good. Uh, let's try this. We only had um, 10 samples. Let's look at the impact of changing the number of bins. So if we had the number of bins, let's say uh, there are um, three bins, right? Uh, so we went from 10 bins to three bins, and we did not change the number of samples. Clear, CLC. So let's see what we uh, get on our display. Okay, it was kind of like a stair step. Okay, well, eh, it's, it's better than the other one. All the bins are populated, but it's still not very indicative of what a uniform would be because the smallest bin, the first bin, only has two samples value of two, the, large, the bin that has the most number of samples has more than twice that. So that's kind of really far off uh, from being representative of a uniform distribution. Let's just for uh, sake of example, let's try two bins and see what happens. Because if you have 10 samples, in the ideal case, you should have five samples in one and five samples in the other. So let's try that and see what happens. Well, eh, it's a little bit closer than the difference between 10 and two, uh, but it's three and seven. Right. Uh, so by, you know, misfortunate, you know, uh, uh, chance, uh, we don't get equal number of representation in the bins. So let's go back to 10 bins and let's set now our samples to be 100. Right. So we're going to have uh, an order of magnitude, uh, more samples. And now we have the same 10 bins that we started out with at the outset. So let me run that. And with 100 samples, well, OK, it's not too, too bad. Right, we have um, three of the bins are the same height, and they're you know roughly between the shortest bin that's eight and the highest bins uh, that's 12, 13. Right, so eight, 13, difference of five. Okay, we could be doing a little bit better. Let's see what happens if we increase it fivefold uh, to 500 samples, and let's see what uh, what happens there. Okay, so now it seems like it's getting a little bit better. So let's try instead of 500, let's try 5,000. All right, tenfold, and let's see what happens. Now you'll notice here it gets closer and closer, right? So we could go to say 50,000, right, from 5,000, and it's going to get closer and closer and closer to being a uniform distribution. Now eventually, um, as we get higher and higher in the number of samples, uh, the bins are going to get uh, closer and closer uh, to what you would expect from a uniform uh, distribution. Uh, moreover, for the same number of bins, let's keep it at 50,000. If I increase my number of bins from 10 to 100, uh, you'll see what happens. So let's save that. And what you'll find is that it gets a lot more jagged, right? And so if you hold fix the number of samples and increase the bin size, you have to have enough, uh, the, it gets more jagged because you have to have now enough samples to ensure that you have representation for each of those bins. In addition, given a fixed bin size, you have to make sure your sample size is big enough that you're going to populate those bins uh, suitably across all the bins that you have if you hold your bins fixed. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So you can't increase both, right? Something breaks. You have to make sure that you have enough representation across all of the ranges of values represented uh, by each of the bins. Okay. So that's the uniform uh, distribution. Let's take a look now at this next distribution. It was the exponential, right? And so the exponential distribution has one parameter. It was, um, let me check the help, um, help exprnd. And it has a single uh, parameter um, that in the, the mu that they call it in the, um, in the uh, API call. So, so let's uh, say, um, Let's do the same thing. Uh, we have number of samples. We'll keep that fixed. Uh, we have A and B. So we have mu, um, exponential mu. And let's just call that, I don't know, um, 7. Just choose a value. Uh, and we're going to say 
exponential samples equals exp r n d uh, the mu parameter for the exponential distribution one by num samples okay and so now i'm going to set a variable num exponential bins and we'll start that out at 10 bins and we'll say histogram let's have a different figure so figure one is for the uniform and figure two uh, we'll have that for the exponential figure two figure two all right so histogram um exponential samples num exp bins and with the exponential distribution, you'll notice there's a lot more detail, if you will, right? Uh, it's a decaying exponential. And so there tends to be more probability mass associated with relatively smaller values relative to the mean. And there are fewer, there's less prob probability mass associated with relatively larger values relative to the mean. And so that means if you're going to set your bin size, you want to make sure that you have enough bins to distinguish between the smaller values and larger values. But also, if you're going to sample, you want to make sure you have enough samples that you get good representation of the smaller values, which are the values more to the right uh, in this um, uh, uh, visualization. And the reason for that is, well, if there are smaller probability, you need a lot more samples to make sure you get coverage for those values that are more rare in their occurrence. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at that. So we start out, and the number of samples, uh, we said it was 50,000. Let's set it back to um, 10, right? Uh, so we save that, and we're going to focus our attention on figure 2. So let's run this. Oops, I misspelled something. There we go. Let me num, not nuim. All right, um, save. So let's run that again. And this is figure two. Let me get rid of figure one. If you look at figure two, well, if you really use your imagination, you could imagine it's exponential, right? Um, here we have a peak to the left. Um, and so that would correspond to the higher probability mass associated with smaller values. And then it kind of comes down, but it does so jaggedly. Uh, so it's you can imagine, if you kind of look at it long enough, there's exponential, but it's really missing uh, quite a bit. Uh, so let's try now in, uh, increasing the number of samples in order of magnitude, tenfold, uh, and let's try this again. Uh, so we kept the number of bins fixed, and we've increased uh, tenfold, and we'll notice here, oh, wait a minute, it's starting to look a lot more exponential. It looks kind of like a stair step, but, you know, if you imagine a, a curve kind of fitted uh, to the uh, upper edge of these bars uh, in the histogram, you can almost see the exponential curve decaying, but there's a little bit of a problem here. On the end, it goes up a little bit, right? Uh, we go from, in the second to last bin, uh, from a count of one to a count of two, right? And exponential doesn't increase. It, it, it continues to decay as you go to the right. Uh, but it's looking a lot more at what you'd think in exponential distribution, how it should look. Uh, so let's now increase another... Um, tenfold to a thousand samples. So we went from 10 samples to a hundred samples, now to a thousand samples. And we held the number of bins uh, for that exponential histogram. Uh, we held that fixed at 10 bins. And so now if with this thousand uh, samples, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for now, now with these thousand samples, it looks exactly like an exponential distribution, right? It kind of scoops down, it continues to decay as you go to the right. Uh, okay, it still looks a little bit jagged, uh, but let's uh, see what happens if we change the number of bins, right? So let's change the number of bins. We held, we'll hold fixed number of samples to be 1,000. We'll change the number of bins. Uh, let's change it to be 100 and see what happens. And so we keep our 1,000 many samples. Uh, we have 100 bins, uh, and now we're running and we're focusing on the exponential. Well, it looks even more exponential, right? Let me get rid of that figure one. Um, so it, it does decay. It does get a little bit bigger as towards the end as you go to the right. Um, it roughly decays, but it's a little bit jagged on that decay, right? And so that means we don't have enough or quite enough samples uh, to fill each of the bins to get suitable representation to visualize uh, this particular distribution that happens to be uh, exponential.
So last thing, let's go to 50,000 samples like we had before, and we'll keep our 100 many bins for the exponential, and we'll run that and see what we get. And look at that, it's perfect, right? Um, and you notice it starts to really curve, right? It's not as jagged in that stair step kind of look. Uh, you can see that as you go out to the right, the tails continue to decay and look like they go to zero, right? Uh, and so this is another demonstration. Um, the uh, relationship between the bin size, the number of bins, or the bin size, I'll say, uh, and the number of samples uh, is different for exponential versus the uniform, but there is still a relationship. And you saw that if we had too few samples, not only was the exponential histogram kind of jagged, you also had some gaps and it didn't continue to decay. The moment we had enough samples, it continued to decay. Uh, and as we increased the bin size, it got less than, as we decreased the bin size rather, increased the number of bins, um, we saw that it gets a lot more smooth in that decay and looks more curved than, than this step, stair step uh, visualization. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? So, you know, we talked last semester about these distributions and we talked about the scenarios that describe the structure of the stochasticity, of the stochasticity that these distributions are useful for, for, for modeling. Uh, and now, um, when you go at a problem, you have to think about what distribution it could be if you're going to visualize it to kind of direct your reasoning about how you should model something. Uh, you want to make sure that you're choosing the number of samples and choosing the bin size appropriately. Okay, so this is the exponential distribution. Uh, let's uh, look at the uh, normal distribution. And the normal distribution has two parameters, uh, the mean mu and the variance sigma squared. Um, and, but in MATLAB in the API call, and it's really important to understand the API call. So let's uh, type help norm RND. And if we look at the API call, uh, norm RND takes two parameters, mu, and it takes sigma, right? When we talk about it, and I don't know why MATLAB implements it this way, uh, the parameters are mu and sigma squared, where sigma squared is the variance. But for the API call, uh, in MATLAB, you have to make sure that you're giving it the standard deviation sigma and not the variance sigma squared. That's really, really important. And this is just an example of the difference between the implementation of the API and what the mathematical theory says. Okay? All right. So let's type, um, let's continue, and let's try this uh, histogram experiment now with the normal distribution. So let's say norm mu. Uh, let's say the mean is, um, I don't know, let's say if it were temperature, say 50 degrees, um, and the um, standard deviation, um, deviation. Uh, so temperature, if temperature increases plus or minus, um, I don't know, let's say plus or minus 5, so 25, yeah, plus or minus, um, let's say 10 degrees. Standard deviation of 10 degrees, so the variance is 100. Okay, uh, so now we say um, num uh, normal bins. Uh, let's say set the number of bins for the normal histogram to be 10, and then we'll say normal samples equals norm R and D, um, norm mu, and standard deviation, and we're going to say it's 1 by num samples, uh, many samples. So now we're going to call that figure three, and we're going to compute the histogram. Histogram. Um, we're going to give it norm samples and num norm bins. Okay. So now save this. And so we have 10 bins, and we're going to set our samples back down to I think we said 10 in the beginning. So 10 samples, and we're going to um, have a normal histogram uh, consisting of 10 bins, and that's going to be uh, figure 3. So let's run this. And if we look at figure 3, let me get rid of the other two, that looks nothing like a normal distribution. A normal distribution is symmetric about its mean. Well, let's go back to the, um, to the slide. Well, that's what a normal should look like, right? There's the mean mu, and it has tails going off to the left and the right. Uh, it is symmetric. If we look at our 
histogram that looks nothing like a normal distribution is certainly not symmetric. Uh, so we're going to need some more samples, right? Um, well, let's start out by just changing the number of bins. Let's say if we had three bins, right? Um, if we had three bins, maybe uh, it'll work, maybe it won't. We'll see what happens. So we do that. Well, figure three, it looks nothing like a normal distribution, right? It is certainly not symmetric. So let's go ahead, set the bins back to 10, and we'll change our sample size. And for our sample size, we'll do an order of magnitude more, so uh, going from 10 to 100 samples. And when we look at figure three for the normal, well, it kind of almost wants to be a normal, and you can imagine, hey, there's a normal distribution, but it's weird. It's, it's skewed left, if you think about it, right? Kind of goes off here, tails to the left. Uh, but you still have one peak, and it almost wants to be symmetric, but it's not symmetric here. You can see um, going from that peak or the mode, um, the ones adjacent to it, those are the are, are same height, so they have the, same, have the same frequency. But this one and the one also, it's peer on the other side, uh, they're, not, they're not the same height, so certainly not symmetric. So let's try um, another order of magnitude. So we started out as 10 uh, samples, went to 100. Now let's try to see what happens when we have 1,000 samples. Uh, so we run this, and wait a minute. Wow, that's almost looking like a normal distribution. Um, if you imagine an envelope, a line that kind of is a best fit to the top edge of each one of these bars uh, for your histogram, for your frequency histogram, it starts to look normal. It has like a normal-ish shape, but you'll notice here it's not symmetric. Here where the peak is, well, the one to the left, to the left and right, they're not the same height, and then after that they're not the same height. But it's a little bit lopsided, but it's looking more and more like a normal distribution. Okay, so let's now um, try to increase the number of samples. Uh, to 50,000, right, uh, like we had before at the end for the others, with 10 bins for the normal. And if we look at that, well, wait a minute, well, it kind of looks like a normal. It's a little bit jagged and kind of stepish, right, um, but it looks more and more normal. Like if you go off into the tails, you have uh, what looks like 1,082 in this bin, and then the other bin is 1,066, which is pretty close uh, to one another. Um, so let's now change the number of bins uh, from uh, 10 to 100. We'll save that, and we'll do this as the last one and continue forward. Uh, it looks a lot more normal, right? You start to see some curvature arise. Now at the peak, certainly it's a little bit jagged, um, but you start to see a curvature, and this looks a lot more like a normal uh, than um, previously. And so the trade-off or the interaction or behavior um, as a consequence of the bin si of the number of bins or bin size uh, and the number of samples is different for the normal distribution uh, from the exponential distribution uh, from the uniform distribution. So if you were going to model a problem and let's say this uh, measurement you're making has temperature or something inertial, you'd say, ah, well, it must be a normal distribution. Um, how many samples should you take to visualize it? If you think it's a normal distribution, you have to make sure that you're choosing your sample size uh, as well as the number of bins uh, suitably. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, and I will certainly uh, post this on the Blackboard uh, alongside uh, the module for uh, Lecture 5. Okay, uh, so that's sampling test. Uh, let's go forward in the slides. Let me do a time check. It is 10.15. And let's uh, continue forward. Okay, so we also have the mixture, and what the mixture is, it's a combination of two different normal distributions. In this particular example, we have normal distribution one, which has its uh, mean mu one, uh, and it also has its variance uh, sigma squared one. Um, uh, normal distribution two, um, it's different from the first normal distribution. It has its mean mu two, and it certainly has its variance uh, sigma squared two. And so what this mixture does, it says, some of the times, at some proportion, it's going to select a sample from the first normal distribution, and some other proportion of the time, it's going to select a sample uh, from the second normal distribution, right? And you can actually synthesize this uh, using uh, stick breaking to select which normal distribution, and then once you select a particular uh, region, the first normal, the second normal, you then uh, use a different uh, set of parameters, mu and sigma squared, uh, in order to do the sampling. Okay, so let's take a look at mixtures, because mixtures are a very important aspect of modeling, right? Uh, and we're going to carry forward, uh, again, 
this homeless population example uh, as a way to talk about how you would generate a mixture uh, in sampling. Okay, so remember when we talked about populations, uh, we created a fictitious population, and it was fictitious because we made the simplifying assumption that all of the various subgroups in this population uh, are non-intersecting. Right. Uh, and we had four different categories of homeless population, the veterans, families, those struggling with drug addiction and aged out foster kids. And um, this is, uh, by the way, called a hierarchical population that are non mixing. Right. Uh, they don't share any attributes, but that's a simplifying assumption. I don't want to pretend that this is exactly the case um, of how the population is structured. But nonetheless, we have these four uh, subgroups and let's just for the sake of our example. Um, let's imagine that from the homeless population, you know, you went out, you did some study, you did a lot of sampling over a number of years, and you figured out from your calculation uh, that the veteran uh, portion is 22% of the population are veterans of the homeless population, 17% uh, of uh, the homeless population's families, 27% struggling with drug addiction, and let's say 34%, the remainder, um, are aged out foster kids. Let's just assume that these values uh, are true for the sake of our simulation of this hierarchical population. Okay, so what do we do? All right, well, uh, that means if we were to look at, say, age, right? Age uh, is a continuous quantity uh, representing time. Uh, we certainly wouldn't use the exponential uh, because for the exponential, we're not talking about the occurrence uh, between two events. Right. So we could certainly use something, you know, if it's number of years of homelessness, right, for these populations, you could use something like a normal distribution uh, to model this. And so here we have a normal distribution governing that measurement for the veterans. So that means 22 percent of the time you're going to sample from that normal distribution representing the veterans. Uh, families, 17 uh, percent of the time. Uh, you're going to sample from a, nor a different normal distribution. It has its own parameters, mu2 and sigma2, or sigma squared2 if you're talking about the variance. Uh, likewise, the drug addicted, 27% of the time, you're going to sample from a third normal distribution, different from the others, and then the remaining 34% of the time, you're going to sample from a fourth normal distribution. So here you have four different normal distributions, each one of them uh, is uh, governing that same measurement, but for a different uh, segment of the population. So we're going to use something like stick breaking. Well, we will use stick breaking to select which distribution you're going to sample from, and then you're going to sample from it. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a two level simulation, one for the stick breaking, and then the other for the uh, normal distribution. Okay, uh, so um, this is the same, the same thing, the normal distribution with different parameters. And then we're going to P is the selection probability. And you're going to set the stick weights um, according to uh, these proportions, 22%, 17%, 27%, and 34%. OK, so we're going to start a stick, right, and do stick breaking. And so we're going to set the stick weights uh, to represent 22% for the first alternative, 17% uh, for the second alternative, 27% uh, for the third alternative, and the remaining 34% uh, uh, for the fourth alternative. Once we select those alternatives, we're going to index into a set of parameters, uh, mu1 sigma um, squared 1 for the first normal distribution, mu2 um, sigma squared 2 for the second, and mu3 and uh, sigma squared 3, and then likewise uh, mu4 and sigma squared 4 for the fourth normal distribution. So um, these proportions are our so-called mixture components, the 22%, 17%, 27%, and 34%. Um, and there's an approach, which I'm not sure if we're going to cover, uh, called expectation maximization, where if you're given a sample, you propose how many different components you have, and it'll find these proportions for you. Um, it's a standard approach uh, in machine learning. Okay, so let's just try this sampling experiment, this two-level sampling. First, we're going to use stick breaking to select which segment of the population we're dealing with. And then once we select that, we're going to use it to sample from one of four different normal distributions. Okay? All right, any questions about this? And so in the interest of time, I already have it done. I will certainly uh, post it on uh, the course blackboard along with uh, this particular module. And so this is called Population Mixture 2020. 
and I'll take the time to explain all of the um, different components here. And so we have our stick, and this is the stick breaking uh, construct, and the stick weights are 22, 17, 27, and 34 respectively, and that represents uh, the individual proportions uh, corresponding to the selection of a different subgroup within the population. And so each of these adds up to 100, right? If we were to add the 22 and 17, 27 and 34, it should. Let's see, 17, 22, 32, 39. Yeah, this adds up to 100. Um, so that represents 100%, and each of these numbers represents that proportion uh, relative to its percentage of the population. Now, certainly, you know, if I didn't say 22%, let's say I said 23% for the first group and 33% for the last group, I can always change this number to 23 and that last number to 33, right? Uh, so it's very easy with stick breaking uh, to change your proportions uh, based on uh, your assumptions uh, for the system that you're trying to model. So then, um, I take a look at all the categories, so I measure the size of the stick and then I sum it together, and then I convert this uh, set of numbers for the stick into proportions. And the reason why, to draw your memory from last semester, uh, why I divide um, the stick uh, weights uh, along the length of the stick uh, by the total is because I want to make it a proportion between 0 and 1 on the real number line. And then I'm going to flip a coin, so to speak, between 0 and 1, so uniformly sample between 0 and 1, and then check to see um, where along the stick uh, that selection of a uh, number between 0 and 1 lies, and that's going to be my selection mechanism. So a longer segment of the stick is going to be more likely uh, to contain that number uh, between 0 or 1, and it's going to do it in proportion to the numbers that I've set for the stick weights. Okay, So here we normalize the stick, right? so we uh, recast these stick weights um, to their proportion relative to the count uh, that they were defined as along the, the number line between 0 and 1 on the real number line. So then I define a bunch of categories. Veteran is 1, family is 2, addicted is 3, and foster is 4. And so this first uh, weight corresponds to the proportion for veterans. The second weight, 17, corresponds to the proportion for families. 27 corresponds to the proportion for addicted. And 34 corresponds to the proportion, 34%, uh, for aged out foster children. So in this particular example, uh, I have have number of trials set to 100,000. Um, I could certainly start with something like 100. Um, and let me just start there and work my way uh, forward. So then I have something called coin flip. Coin flip is going to be that randomized uh, selection between 0 and 1 on the real number line. And then we're going to check coin flip uh, to see where it lies along this normalized stick. And I'm going to use that to select one of four categories, the first piece, the second piece, the third piece, or the fourth piece along that stick. Okay, now the mu's. The mu's, um, this is an array of four values. Each position represents mu uh, for the first distribution, the second distribution, the third, and the fourth. And so uh, mu uh, for the first uh, group, uh, mu sub one, um, that's going to be the uh, mean age of the uh, veterans. 35 is going to be the mean age of families. 70, um, just set it uh, is going to be the mean age for addicted and 75 is the mean age for aged out foster children. I didn't have to set it this way. I just picked those numbers and it's certainly something that you can tinker with. Uh, sigma squared, of course, um, I set sigma squared. Now this is programmatic just for the sake of showing you that sigma squared is the square of sigma, right? Uh, so I like to write things for um, teaching reasons uh, to make it uh, obvious certain concepts that I want to reinforce. So for each distribution, each distribution um, is a normal distribution, and a normal distribution has a mu and a sigma squared as the parameters. So here, sigma squared, the first position is the sigma squared for the first uh, normal distribution. Then I have uh, 4 times 4, 16, then 100, and 25, right? So if you are talking about the first normal distribution, right, um, there's its mu is 21, and its sigma squared is 4. Okay, and similarly for the other positions. So here I set some parameter values, I have uh, some ages, and then in a, some number of trials, which is set to 100, I flip a uniform coin, and then I check the boundaries of each segment on the stick. Uh, so here's the high end and the low end, uh, and I check the range to see if my 
coin flip between zero and one on the real number line is greater than uh, the low end, uh, less than the high end. And if it is, I save that selection, and then I do bounds checking appropriately. If you're in the last segment, you're going to do less than equal to for the high end, not just less than. And I save off the, the selection. So then, given my selection, that selection is going to be one, two, three, or four. If I've selected veterans, if I've selected um, family, addicted, or foster children, I'm going to index into the array of mu values and the array of sigma squared values. And I calculate sigma as being the square root of sigma squared. And then I do a sampling from the normal distribution and I save off that age. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right. So I compute a histogram. Let me change it to histogram. And then I'm going to, my histogram has number of bins, num bins, num mixture bins is 100 bins, right? Uh, because age between 0 and 100 kind of seems right. Um, so let's say num uh, mixture bins. OK. And this is our mixture distribution. Now, of course, in this example, our mixture distribution, unlike in the slide, all right, when I talked about um, the mixtures, there it is. Nope. Um, let me just see if I can find this. Uh, there it is. In the mixture that I showed you from before, that mixture is a mixture of two um, normal distributions. But for the mixture that we are doing in the code, that's a mixture of four um, normal distributions, right? And so certainly it's a lot more complex, the example that I'm showing you, uh, that I'm sampling from uh, in this example. So we have 100 bins. And I chose 100 bins specifically uh, because it represents age, right? And the span of ages is roughly between 0 and 100 for the most part. And you might have someone who's like 110 or what have you, uh, but you could certainly adjust it very easily. So we have 100 different bins representing age groups, and the number of samples, I think, was uh, number of trials was 100, right? Uh, so let's try this and see what happens. Oops. Num mixture. Bins. There we go. Uh, spelling always uh, going to creep up on you. All right. There we go. So let's run this. So we look at this, and it's a four mixture, four components of a normal distribution. Well, there's two bumps. There's one here on the low side, one on the high side. But I don't really see all four bumps for the normal, right? So that means, you know, we certainly deliberately chose the number of bins to kind of map to the ages that we're going to see between 0 and 100. Uh, so let's try to increase the number of samples, right? Uh, so let me num trials. Let me just change num trials down here because I don't want to have to scroll up and down all the time. Num no, actually, that's not going to work. I have to do it up before I do the sampling. Um, num trials, let's say num trials is 10,000, right? Uh, so we went from 100 to 10,000, two orders of magnitude. And let's now rerun this and see what happens. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. This kind of looks like a mixture, but it looks like three and not the four that we wanted. Well, let's see if we can go even higher on the number of mixtures. And it could be that two of these normals are so close together, they just kind of get mushed together as far as the samples are concerned. Uh, so let's try number of trials is 50,000. All right. Um, and let's save that and let's run. So now it looks a lot smoother, uh, but that means two of these are, are too close together to really make a difference. So let's just try this. Uh, let's take the mu, right? Um, and it's 35. Let's change the age to, um, uh, addicted from 70, because uh, 70 is probably a little bit too old. Uh, so let's change that to um, 46. And uh, let's call this. Um, Aged out foster is usually a lot younger, right? So let's call um, let's call veterans 35. I'm trying to spread them out. Um, family, uh, let's call that uh, 48. Um, uh, addicted, let's call that um, 59. Age foster, let's call that uh, 19, right? And let's see what happens. So we save that and let's run it. <laughs> 
and we see, ah, wait a minute. Now what we see here, right? We see one normal distribution, we see a second one, we see a third one, and then there's this fourth one that's kind of, you know, shares a lot of um, values uh, with, uh, with, um, with the third uh, hump, right? And if you play with the numbers and the and the and the and the variances enough, you'll actually see all four of the of the distributions of the normals in the mixture arise separately. But that's not the point, right? The point is uh, that with a complex distribution, this hierarchical population consisting of a mixture of four groups, uh, you can actually simulate that too. And as far as visualizing it uh, in a histogram. Um, it's really, really important in this case to make sure that you get the bin size right, uh, the, or the number of bins right, as well as the number of samples. And in this case, unlike the others, we weren't tinkering with the bin size, uh, the number of bins. I keep saying bin size because bin size is controlled by the number of bins. So the larger the number of bins, the smaller the bin size. And so here, uh, the number of bins um, I fixed at 100 because that's indicative of the actual problem itself because I want to re uh, represent ages that are roughly, you know, one year each among each of these uh, folks in the, in the in the group. And so, for some problems, you can't just arbitrarily set the number of bins. It has to mirror uh, that particular quantity uh, of interest that you're trying to depict uh, or measure. And so here, uh, we had to go really high in the number of uh, samples uh, in order to get some good representation um, of uh, members of the population. Okay, does that make sense? All right, any questions about this? So that just says, yes, histogram is a very um, seemingly straightforward uh, visualization uh, mechanism, but even in uh, dealing with histogram, there are a lot of considerations that are really, really important uh, to understand uh, in order uh, to represent suitably the underlying distribution you're trying to visualize. Okay, any questions about this? <clears throat> I don't know why I'm so thirsty. All right, <clears throat> so we have about nine more minutes. Okay, so let's take a look uh, at this next one, stem and leaf. And stem and leaf uh, is a kind of, you know, very, very simple, you know, uh, restaurant napkin type of calculation you can do. Um, a stem uh, represents the first few digits of a number and the leaf is nothing more than the next digit. Here we have a bunch of numbers, uh, 10, 11, 15, 21, and so forth. And if we take as our stem, for example, uh, the uh, tens place, right? Uh, and we take as our leaf the ones place, okay, well, if we have the tens place, here we have 10 something, we have 20 something and 30 something. And so we list all of the stems uh, to the left of this uh, bar, vertical bar, and then we write down all of the leaf values corresponding uh, to the leaf position uh, for the number for each one of these measurements. So here, for the tens place, so that's one times 10 to the one, so I have a 10, so that's zero, I write down a zero, 11, in the ones place there's a one, so I write down a one, and a 15, that's a five in the ones place, so I write down a five. In similar fashion, for the 20s, I have 21, 23, 25, and 27. So here I write uh, for the uh, stem a two, representing the tens position, two times 10 to the one is 20. And so I have 21, 23, 25, 27, so I write down one, three, five, seven. Likewise, uh, for the threes, the 30s rather, I write down a three here as uh, my stem, and I have a 33 and 35 uh, in the ones, uh, three and a five in the ones position, and so I write down a three and I write down a five, okay? Now, if you turn your head 90 degrees clockwise, right, you can almost imagine this as a histogram, right? And you can imagine uh, this would be the horizontal axis if I were to shift it like that. And each one of these uh, leaves that are stacked up, um, you can imagine as the height of some bar in a histogram, right? Now, of course, you can only depict this uh, for a leaf versus a uh, a stem versus a leaf, um, but it's a quick and dirty way of looking at the distribution uh, of a bunch of numbers, and it's something you can just scribble out on a piece of paper. Okay, so you can impress your friends with, uh, say, oh, well, you know what? Um, the numbers most favored here is going to be the 20s because, of course, that um, set of uh, leaves is taller if you were to flip this on its uh, on its side. Okay, any questions about this? All right, uh, so we can also 
uh, do this, it's like saying you have a histograms of 10s, 20s, and 30s. So you can also do this to make multiple comparisons. Uh, in this particular example, uh, we have two uh, sets of measurements, one associated with the first location, one associated uh, with a second location. And so in this uh, leaf and stem, uh, they're comparing those two system of measurements. And so the first location is everything on the left-hand side, your left, and the second location is everything on the right-hand side, your right. And so the leaf is the 1,000th uh, place. Did I get that right? No, the stem, rather, is the is the 100th place, and the leaf is the 1 1,000th place. Uh, so let me explain. So here, in the 1 uh, 100th place, uh, let's look at location 1. You have 0 0 0.0156, and so forth. So um, if you were to look at the 1 100th uh, place for the stem, you have uh, 0.01, you have a 0.03, you have a 0.04, you have a 0.03, a 0.05, a 0.02, and so forth. So here, in the center here, those are all of the multiples of 1 100th, right? Because in the decomposition of these decimal numbers, uh, you have 0.00, 0.01, 0.02 something, 0.03 something, 0.04 something, and so forth. Uh, so you list all of those stems, in this particular case, it's for 0.00 up through 0.07. Right for all of the one one hundredths in the decompositions of these decimal numbers. So for the leaves, you're going to look at the next digit, which is uh, the one one thousandth place. So going for location one, these are in some order, so, uh, and we have 0 0.0156. So 0 0.015, because that's 0 0.015. Here we have 0 0.039, so 039. And then you have 0 0.035, 0 0.03. 5, and so forth, right? And so if we do that for all the numbers from location 1, uh, location 1 in this example is to the left, and location 2 is to the right, you can imagine these as histograms. So if you kind of turn your head uh, anticlockwise 90 degrees, you'll notice that uh, for location 1, uh, it tends to favor values uh, that are in this range, and it's much taller, whereas for location 2, it's a bimodal distribution, meaning it either favors values that are here, or values that are here, right? And so again, with this leaf and stem plot, you can represent distributions of numbers just on a granularity of the leaf and stem, but still, it's a quick and dirty thing you can do. We don't need a computer. You can just write it down on a piece of paper very quickly to get a coarse sense of the types of values you're getting uh, from measurements given to you by some system, okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, <clears throat> so that's leaf and stem. Uh, let's end with a box plot. I'm not sure if we're going to finish it in the next uh, five minutes. Uh, we'll see. Um, so often when you want a quick high-level view of your data, that may include things like the center of mass or the mean, uh, how spread out your values are, because that's of important consideration when you're dealing with data, right? Uh, or maybe how big or how small your data values can get. Because if it's things related to finance, you want to know how much budget you need, for example. Uh, so the sample mean defines the center of mass, uh, the central value. The quartiles are a great way to measure um, how spread out your values are. Uh, the max and the min, certainly, those are statistics. They're functions over data. Take the biggest one, take the smallest one. Uh, and those are good for talking about how big or small your values can get. And so, for example, you know, in a weather report, you might say you'll be expecting an average temperature of 47 degrees, highs of 55, lows of 32. Sounds a lot like Delaware. Uh, across the region, your local averages, uh, your local averages are most likely to span between 50 and 44, right? Because certainly, um, even in the same region, if you go closer to the coast versus more inland, temperature changes. If you're more urban versus more rural, your temperature profile changes in terms of its variability. And of course, you know, people care about variability of temperature. Uh, agriculture, they care about variability of temperature. Uh, for garbage dumps and trash incinerators, they care about uh, the local temperature. And these are so-called uh, local climactic effects, right? Um, here, Dover is not that big, but absolutely, you go closer uh, to the Delaware Bay, and the temperature is very different from even just 20 miles inland, uh, getting to like uh, Hartley and 
you know, uh, more rural parts of Delaware. Okay, so you can find this stuff on a site like weather.gov. Uh, and so this five point summary, the minimum um, measurement, the min XI, uh, the maximum, you have the first quartile Q1 hat, and this is the sample quartile from the data. Uh, you have the third quartile Q3 hat, and then you have the sample median. Right, which is the middle order statistic, as it's sometimes called. Uh, the sample mean in this five-point summary, the box plot, is often represented as a dot uh, or a cross. And so putting all this together in the following um, visualization is a very compact way of representing a lot of pieces of information about your data. And so I'll annotate this. Uh, here we have the sample mean. It's a cross in this particular example. And then... Um, the vertical bar marks the location of the sample median, and you can imagine the values are left to right, right? And so you have the first quartile is here, uh, where this vertical bar uh, uh, touches the, the number line. And then this is the median, which is also the second quartile. And then you have Q3, which is uh, this um, right-hand edge uh, of this box. And then the difference between Q3 and Q1 is the interquartile range. That's the width of this box here, the difference between Q3 hat and Q1 hat. And so the min uh, is where this left whisker extends, right? That's the minimum value. And the max extends to where this right whisker uh, extends. And if certainly you can mark outliers, uh, typically as these dots that are, are uh, either to the left of the left whisker or to the right of the right whisker, and you can determine whether something's an outlier depending on 1.5 IQR, as we had discussed before. Okay, uh, so let's take a look uh, at an example, and this uses the same data that we had talked about before, uh, where we measured uh, the CPU time of 30 different processes sampled from a system. And so using this um, uh, box whisker plot, here we have uh, the sample uh, median. So let's, uh, let's go through the numbers here. So X bar, our sample mean, is 48 and change. So if you take uh, this cross here and project it down, it's at 48 and 0.233. The minimum value is 9, right? So if you take this left-hand whisker, it extends out uh, to uh, 9. Um, the uh, interquartile range is the difference between Q1 and Q3. Q1 hat is 34, so that's here, and Q3 hat is 59, right? So the minimum is nine. And then the maximum, that's an interesting uh, calculation. Um, you notice the maximum is 139, which is way out here, but this maximum is uh, to the right of that whisker, right? And how did they, um, they so that means they consider uh, this maximum 139 to be an outlier. And if you look at all these numbers here, well, you have like 56, 55, 62, 89, all of a sudden 139. It's an oddball relative to the others. And what they've done is they've used um, interquartile range and said, you know what? Um, this 139 is uh, outside of 99.3% of all of the measurements. And so we're going to call that an outlier. And how they mark that is you can see the dot there floating out to the right. Uh, for 139 on the number line, and it's not connected uh, to that whisker, that whisker goes out to uh, 89, which is right along there, right? And so this is an example of a box whisker plot, and it's a nice compact way of describing uh, your data. So let me do the time check. It's 1045. Let me end there. I won't keep you over. Uh, I will see you all on Thursday.